Hi everyone, it's uh, fantastic to, uh, to be here um, to present the work that we're doing at the, uh, the University of Melbourne. First of all, I'd like to do uh, an acknowledgement of, of country um, that we at the University of Melbourne work on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years. I thank them for their care of the land, the water and the air and acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend this to all Indigenous and First Nations people here today. So feel free to use the, uh, the chat and the Q&A to ask any questions. We're all going to be presenting for around about five minutes and then we'll do a bit of a, a round table discussion of some of the themes. So we're really happy to engage in that way as well. Here's our themes that we'll be covering in various, various ways. So we've got lots of different areas happening at, at the university. Um, and here's uh, who will be presenting today. I won't read out everyone there, but I'll introduce everyone just before uh, we, we speak. So uh, I'm the immersive media coordinator at, uh, at the university. So I help look after lots of digital things. Uh, specifically on my focus is on VR and AR. And I have a, an interest in the uh, digitization um, of 3D models and how we can use those because we've got this increasing need to not only retain but manage and deliver 3D assets. If a student wants to use something, a 3D model for something, where can they go? Where can they use it? How do they incorporate it into their work? So this is something that we've seen coming for a few years and it's now becoming more of an issue. But thankfully, we've got enough people in different departments who are looking into this area to help uh, help us deal with it. Uh, ben Croonan, who will talk soon, he's he's been running his Sketchfab page for quite some time now, June 2nd, 2014, we see there. Got lots of great content there. Uh, Rita, who we'll, we'll talk a bit later, she's got some amazing scans in the dental school, but we're currently using Sketchfab for, well, we have been for a while and we, we will continue, but we are also using um, Pedestal. Uh, which is a, a great system. So we're, we've kind of got a foot in, foot in both camps at the moment. That's our pedestal page that we're, we're currently, we've had it for about a year now, or, or the, um, in this form. We've been testing it for a bit longer, but starting to, to fill it out with content. So as we go through, I'll put links in the chat so you can look at the various uh, things that we're, we're going to be talking about as well, because um, we're going to be flying through fairly fairly quickly. But first of all, I'd like to introduce Naomi Malumbi, who is the faculty librarian for architecture, building and planning. Um, Naomi is a faculty and school librarian with over 15 years experience in higher education. Naomi specializes in building unique collection projects, aligning them to teaching, research, exhibitions and other engagement opportunities. So I will pass over to Naomi now. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, Ben. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, what I'd really like to do is introduce this collection as being 3D scans that capture the choir history of heritage building materials, which for this audience, you know, you may be used to seeing small, unassuming looking objects and making connections. But for the disciplines that I work in, which is namely architecture and urban history, 3D scanning really means site and structure scans. It's very rare that I can find that we actually do projects around collecting the, the the little objects, the things that make buildings a whole. So these are very ordinary looking objects. Um, they are very unassuming looking. Behind me is the picture of what they look like in the university stored away in cupboards. And as we were doing this project, you can imagine some of the comments I got from the architects. As I said, we're taking them out to scan them. Why would you do that? There was a lot of questioning about what you would do. But what I think when they transform into 3D, they become, move from ordinary to extraordinary. And as we go through, you'll see the montage roll, you're seeing a brick spin, but there's wallpaper that comes off and you see all the layers behind in the wallpaper, there's shingles with nails in it. It's all the tiny little details of the object that become more in the 3D object. So that I didn't really anticipate when we transformed into 3D. But let me roll back to why, why do this project? So I have a very, very librarian perspective of this. I think about access and preservation. And 
listening to yesterday's presentations, I could hear that there were similar themes coming up. When you do a three, when you do any digitization project, it's absolutely resource intensive. So it's, it's, I find vital to think about how you're going to provide the best access and how you're going to present it in a way that keeps it preserved. So there's a couple of unique things that we've done for this project that I can see. So access, first of all, with a librarian point of view, it's very different from a museum or an archives point of view. When you go into a museum, you see a very curated version of the objects presented well. When you go into an archive, you may get some boxes out and you may get rummage through, but it's very mediated access. In a library, when you go into a library, we are doing our best if you can't notice that we're even there. You can go in and you can find what you want and hopefully you might find other things as well that spark up your imagination and you take that and you use that for whatever researchers purposes you want. So for librarians, the best thing we could possibly do is to provide the way we can access it so that we're never seen and you can do exactly what you want. We want to give you the most optimum range to do what you want with these materials. So that's what I brought to this project. Now, how we went about doing this is um, looking at how people engage with these objects in the teaching and to pick them up, we saw students pick them up, think about it, look at them, question them, and then ask the collector of this presentation, um, of this collection, questions about why these materials were collected. So that translated into the project when we thought about how we created the metadata and then how we also presented the files. So for this project, what's very unique is that not only have we got the presentation files, which are these ones spinning around in pedestal in 3D, but we also have all the original files on the repository. And the reason why we've done this is because when we question how we're going to do this project, we want to keep it in a state that responds to changes in technology. So it's absolutely vital that, yes, I've set up all the parameters, collected the metadata, created the right access preser um, preservation techniques around copyright, open access, creative commons, but also that I've provided a way in the future for when technology changes, we can go back and get those files that were done for each of these scans and then move them as technology changes. Um, I will say a couple of other things. We've also got in, because we've learned a little bit from museums, we've got videos on our website to try and tell the backstory of this collection because they're unassuming objects. We actually have the, the collection creator on board and we have captured his oral histories along with this. So they'll come online in a couple of weeks time, hopefully for Christmas, but as with COVID, everything gets blown out. So what I would say for this particular project, it's not a teaching and learning collection specifically for one class or for a faculty. It's aimed at being absolutely open access, shared with whoever. We don't want to predict how it's going to be used. We've just done the best that we can to make this collection presentable. Um, and we hope it's a robust approach. That's pretty much all I wanted to say initially. Ben, did you? Yeah, no, that's great, Naomi. And, um, you were saying it's probably the, the launch of the project is another few few weeks away. Is that oh, the, the, the plan? Yes. That'll be shared more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yep. so we're really excited. I mean, there's some amazing objects here and the fact that you'll be able to download them and reuse them, I think is sort of testament to that open access um, way, you know, things that we could build in, in a virtual world with all these uh, broken tiles and bricks um, <laughs> and being able to uh, to build things up. It's a really great start for that. So um, yeah, fantastic. We'll chat a little bit more uh, down, the, down the track, but I'll uh, pass over to Ben Croonan now as I stop my screen sharing and introduce uh, his next section. So Ben is a scientific photographer with 30 years of experience in providing specialist imaging, IT and technical support to academics and researchers at the University of Melbourne. So Ben's been working with photogrammetry <laughs> for over 12 years and began the pilot of Pedestal 3D uh, at the university in 2019. So Ben's really sort of at the forefront of a lot of our digitizing and scanning. So if anyone has questions about that, we're always like, talk to Ben, he'll, he'll uh, be able to 
uh, tell you what's uh, what's good and what's not good and, and techniques. So we're, we're really glad to have Ben along today to talk about some of the work he's doing. Thanks, Ben. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, to start off with, uh, today I'm going to be talking about challenges of implementing new technologies, particularly with relation to 3D scanning and mostly photogrammetry um, within a large university. Um, but I'd like to start by acknowledging that we've done a lot of good stuff, but my job involves looking at things that are not quite right. Uh, and so this is what I'll be doing, hopefully, for the next five minutes. It's moving the presenters over so I can see the slides. Um, so I've been working with digital technologies for over 30 years uh, and I've seen the transition of many processes from analog to digital uh, and also seen file formats come and go, compression codecs come and go for video and all those sorts of things and a lot of the problems uh, associated with those. So photogrammetry has been quite appealing um, within the university context because it's essentially magic. You take, take a bunch of images, throw it into some software and, and hey presto, out comes a, a textured image. Um, and in theory, it is actually possible to do that. But in, in reality, it requires a certain amount of expertise and knowledge of the processes behind it to make it all work properly. Um, so in many cases, it can work as, as you would expect it to, but it can also go horribly wrong. Um, so looking firstly at, at people um, and also in, particular in relation to expertise of, of the people involved, um, there are a certain number of requirements in terms of implementing new technologies. Um, and in this particular case, um, there's a lot of different um, interdisciplinary sort of knowledge that's required, photogrammetry, understanding photogrammetry process, phot sorry, photography processes. Um, the photogrammetry algorithm, how it works, how it doesn't work or how it fails, 3D sculpting, 3D modeling, uh, and then also other delivery and reuse of, of the final processes, having the equipment uh, to both do the scanning and the processing, and also having the time to both acquire the skills and expertise, acquire the data, do all the data processing, and recovering from when things don't go well and, and you know, things go wrong, and figuring out how to handle exceptions, so things that are extremely big or extremely small or extremely complex compared to most of the things that might be sort of done fairly easily. So scientific photographers um, have got a lot of those um, bits of expertise already um, and, and learning things like phot photogrammetry fills, fits into uh, our normal professional development. So a lot of the scientific photographers in the university have sort of done this. However, um, with various budgetary pressures on departments uh, over the last two decades, we've seen a gradual redu reduction of all sort of technical support staff in academic departments across the university. And this has been accelerated uh, by a massive restructure in 2014 that left only four photographers on campus. Uh, and today there are only three uh, left on campus. Other related areas of expertise are also scattered around the, depart uh, around the, the campus. Um, particularly in engineering, a lot of people don't sort of tend to think of talking to the engineers, but they're the people who actually teach this sort of stuff. Um, but we often sort of try and blaze on ahead without actually talking to them when, when they are the field experts in these sorts of things. Uh, so a key part of providing a service or figuring out how to do stuff um, is looking at the data management thing. So if you consider 3D scans as, as digital data, you inevitably end up looking looking at something like the, uh, the OAIS uh, as a functional model for trying to do things. Uh, and we found it fairly useful in building our processes. However, digitization isn't actually producing data, it's transforming uh, analog data. Um, sorry, just skip through that one. Um, so you also have the processes then of actually managing the physical collections and then having digitization and transforming those into a digital collection. However, and we are here, we're stuck in the middle. Um, and a lot of what we do is actually looks like, uh, again, another version of this functional model jammed in between those particular things. However, what we normally see though, is that someone's got a lot of stuff and they wanna run a project to 3D scan it and digitize it and, and make it available online essentially stripping out most of those particular things. However, we've built our processes 
based on having actually all of those other things of the planning of the and management of the physical as, uh, assets and the digital assets um, and um, and so without those, our processes actually start to fall apart and things take longer, a lot longer to do uh, and it becomes a lot more difficult. Uh, I have a quick case study. Um, so for example, for QuickTime VR, a number of departments have gone, okay, there's a hot new format, get some funding, outsource the digitization, uh, archive the data and get the online versions. Sorry, I won't be very long. Uh, so the file format died uh, eventually. And in theory, we could reauthor the source data from the archive data and create a hot new format. But uh, what actually ended up happening, of course, was that the source data was left with the provider because no one thought about archiving them. Uh, they just wanted to get the online versions. The provider was made redundant. So the archives were lost. Attempts to reprocess the online versions failed. Um, the fact that they attempted even despite being told that it would fail um, is sort of another thing. And so we end up in a situation where we end up in a loop of not really archiving things properly, focusing on the online versions, and then things change and we have to go back through to getting new, more funding and doing particular things. Uh, I'm gonna squeeze things through just very quickly. Um, in terms of providing broader reach infrastructure um, and resources, the data applies to a whole bunch of different areas. However, the way we approach the provision of services and infrastructure within the universities is very siloed. And so trying to actually make a case for improving these particular things means you can only really apl um, apply that to one particular area because you need to get a, DV, a DVC to be the champion to, to forward your, your calls. But you can't make a big enough course for any one of those areas individually to actually get things moving. So often what we end up with is having a lot of individual isolated things um, that are varying scales of people doing whatever they can within their own individual areas. And again, they're all still siloed and not really talking to each other. So very quickly, some parting thoughts. There's a lot more to doing this than just 3D scanning. We're all trying to help each other as best we can with what little we have. The days of departmental tech support staff are largely over. Uh, it, it's pretty much economically unviable with the current operating models of the university. We need to think about we need to rethink the provision of technical support to reverse the expertise drain out of the university so we've got people who know how to do stuff to help us actually implement our ideas uh, and also if we don't start talking about what what's not quite right with our projects we're just allowing others to keep making the same mistakes uh, and so on that note i will pass back to ben to resume our normal transmission of awesomeness uh, thank you Thanks, for listening ben. That um, you uh, you articulated and nailed the visuals very well about the problems at uh, the university about uh, the silos and trying to bring everything together. I mean, we're making good strides in in kind of getting people from different departments to uh, to do that to some degree. Um, but yeah, we've definitely still got a lot of work to do um, for the next for the next stage as well. So on that note, I will uh, introduce Rita. So Dr. Rita Hardiman is a teaching and research academic at the university's Melbourne Dental School. Rita's research and teaching interests involve anatomy, morphology, and mineralized tissues, the perfect mix for virtual object-based methodologies. Rita has used micro CT and clinical CT to create virtual volumetric models of skulls and teeth, which you'll see a little bit of soon. These are displayed online, embedded in Canvas subjects and used for 3D printing. She initiated and maintains the Dental School's Sketchfab page and is now migrating to Pedestal. Uh, her innovative use of 3D models in teaching in have resulted in two learning and teaching initiative grants, a learning and teaching futures grant and an animal welfare excellence award. So thank you, Rita. I'll pass over to you. Excuse me, thanks, Ben. I'll, um, I'll share my screen so I can get started. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so as Ben said in that lovely introduction, I am from the Melbourne Dental School, which might seem a little bit niche for a topic like this, um, but it fits in really well with what Ben Crinan was saying just a minute ago, because I'm one of those people who is trying to do all of those things um, pretty much at once, um, albeit step by step. So at the dental school, uh, we have a number of 
biological collections. Um, you can see those represented here. I work with all of them um, and try to take care of all of them. So my time squeezes down to a tiny, to a tiny fraction. I don't have any free time, it seems. Um, but you can see here there's quite a variety. Uh, and we use these collections um, all over the place. So we we, sep we separated them into a number of areas. They're all mineralized tissue. There are other collections that are not, but these are um, probably by far the greatest in number. So we have a, a human skull collection. We have a comparative odontology collection, which is uh, animal skulls and teeth. Uh, we have quite a number of extracted teeth. Um, you can imagine in a dental school, especially historically, uh, they tend to collect these things and amass them in vast numbers. Um, and then we have a, a special category, which is a research collection made up of uh, human femoral bone, which has a separate history and, and provenance, but is, is heavily used in research. Um, all of those collections are used across our three main activity domains. So in teaching and learning, and you can see here, obviously pre-2020, this is um, me demonstrating a skull on um, a document camera in a lecture theatre. Uh, engagement, so our collections are often used in uh, medical history museum exhibitions, dental uh, museum exhibitions. And then obviously research as well. So this is a tooth scanned with micro CT um, and separated into its different uh, density components. So historically, the problem um, with our collections are that they are hands off. So especially for students, um, because they're so precious, usually uh, students see them behind glass or they're in storage. And obviously they're local only. So you have to come to us to see them. Um, they're static. So they're one size, you can't blow them up. You can't cut them. Um, they're untouchable. So, you know, you can't access them fully and uh, they're usually whole. So in terms of skulls, um, you know, if you leave the calvaria on, it's very difficult to see uh, the cranial base, for example. But you can't cut them because once you once you section them, that's it. You can't go back. Um, and they're unique. Usually we have one authentic example, even though we might want to show 100 students what this is like. And uh, that's problematic. So we thought about how to change this and that the pivotal moment came when I was working with micro CT and figured out that I could scan something and turn it into a 3D model. Um, so that's what we've done largely with, with a lot of our um, collections. Well, I say largely, we've got quite a few. The, the beauty of that is because I've used micro CT and clinical CT, we have all the raw image files and um, we can go back and, and repurpose them a little bit. And we can also use them in, in research um, by sending people the raw files. So we have... Um, you know, part of our research is also research high degree programs, and PhDs, master's honours, and not only in-house, so people come to us to study with these, but we also send files to them um, for use in their research. Um, so this is one example, of course, we, we would never um, hand this skull out to students, they're so precious. But what we can do is scan them and keep them. So this is a still from uh, Sketchfab, and what you can do is fly in, uh, well, pretty much from any surface, but from the frame and magnum. And you can see there's an injury here um, represented virtually. And then on the inside, you can actually see the, the leaves of, of bone that have been folded back. Um, we've also started printing them. So some of our collections uh, have been scanned uh, displayed on Sketchfab and then printed. So other departments use these in their teaching. So biosciences, for example, use a lot of our comparative odontology collections in their teaching. And you can see this in particular is a, a thylacine skull, which is extremely rare and you can't share it around for teaching or engagement purposes, but you can now um, because they've been printed out. Um, so as Ben said, we've got lots of things, 80 plus models on Sketchfab. There's a link, anyone can come and see it. It's like social media for 3D models. Uh, and we're slowly moving to pedestal because there are more capabilities um, like slicing and measuring more effectively. 
And yeah, I hope that gives you enough of an introduction and, and I look forward to questions and discussion. Thanks, Rita. That's awesome uh, showing the, the kinds of work that's being done there. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Monique Weber, and let me just share into that one so I can bring up the slide. Uh, so Dr. Monique Weber is a teaching specialist in ancient world studies at the University of Melbourne. Her research uh, centres on the impact of urban environments upon cultural expression. Monique's teaching practice embraces technology, object-based learning, and inquisitive models to create engaging virtual and physical learning environments. She's also active in the academic community uh, engagement and contemporary art and architectural criticism. So thanks, Monique. I will hand over to you. Thank you so much, Ben. I'll just share my screen with everyone. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all. So let's begin. Before I begin, I just want to sort of strengthen Ben's acknowledgement of country and just specify that when I'm talking in this section about culture, I'm speaking specifically of European culture because I'm teaching ancient Greece and Rome. But I want to acknowledge that there were pre-existing contemporary and later concepts of culture as well. Our big question for today is, how can the collaborative experience of digital object-based learning in ancient world studies, and to use something from um, my family's Rita's term, something that they might seem quite niche, promote equity and workplace skills in a broader sense. To discuss this very briefly, I'm going to be using one of my subjects as an example. This is ANCW 1002, Myth, Art and Empire, Greece and Rome, a very long standing subject at the university, something I actually took myself and which is now one of my own. This is a very large cohort subject. We had 270 students this year. It's one of the main introductory first year subjects. What is really important to note here is that it is a mixed cohort. So we have students ranging from those who are core who are, have been studying ancient world studies, perhaps at high school, and are looking to move into the field as academics, as archeologists, as curators, to students who are taking it as complementary. We have a lot of students from say, creative writing or from art history who are looking to expand that knowledge, as well as breadth students. And at the University of Melbourne, breadth are students from a completely different discipline. So we might have students from science or from commerce. What is really important here is that we want to embrace all of our students. We want to encourage their voices, but we also want to give them workplace relevant skills for everyone, regardless of their entering our field or entering another field. We can really see this in the fact that our subject is very multidisciplinary. This actually reflects ancient world studies, which is inherently multidisciplinary. But we look at all different relevant methodologies. We look at classics, archaeology, history, art history, literature. And this is where object-based learning helps us to embrace diversity and create a sense of equity. Because we focus so much on art history, object-based learning has always been central to the teaching and learning of this subject. At certain times of the semester, when we're on campus, our students take classes in the Arts West OBL labs or object-based learning labs where they learn to examine ancient objects from our classics and archaeology collections. You can see that there at the top right. However, digital OBL, which I'll refer to as from now on to save, to save time, has been a part of this subject for a number of years. While our students, they are so excited to get into the labs and to handle the objects, it's a real focus of our teaching. There's also frequently quite a hesitancy around the objects, and I'm sure many of you will have experienced this with your students. It's either because the students are painfully aware of the antiquity's fragility and value, particularly when you pass them something, say, oh, by the way, this is 3,000 years old, or more pedagogically, because they're more used to dealing with text and a shift in any methodology can be quite confronting. Using digital models in the preparation for object-based learning on campus models helps the students to understand the learning process. So they're prepared to work with physical objects. And this is something that we do a lot because we get the students to look at the digital models in the classroom. And then we look at the real thing in the lab. But I wanted to highlight that this is not a supplementary. We like to look at them in a complementary manner because it also ameliorates issues of access and equity. Only so many students can hold or even view an object at one time, whereas everyone can access a digital image. Some students may have physical obstacles to handling and visually assessing an object, while the digital image can be manipulated in space. And I'll come back to that concept in a minute. 
This also helps with equity on a global scale. Our discipline really suffers from masterpiece culture. There are certain objects that you need to know, you need to see. And whereas our colleagues in Europe can take our students just to see them, we can't. We can access them through Sketchfab and things like that. But as a result, we often see the Australian collections as secondary, when in fact, it is through giving equal weight to little known collections and objects that we can forge new knowledge. We want our students to be aware of the Ludovisi Gaul or the Venus di Milo, but isn't it more exciting that they can say something about a sarcophagus that no one has said before? In the past, this has all been really important, but more of a solution to a problem. This year, I felt there were enough excuses and promises that things will be better in a normal situation. When we get back into the OBL lab, you can do the real thing. So while Digital OBL achieved all of these aims in 2021, it also be, it's become a feature of our program looking forward with a teaching philosophy that this practice enhances rather than is a poor substitute for in-person object-based learning. I'm going to briefly just look at two examples of how we approach this. So what are the benefits of the 3D pedestal interface and digital object-based learning for teaching and learning? To begin with, let's look at what we've created as a joint project between myself, another colleague from Classic, Ancient World Studies, Ben Loveridge, and my colleagues in the OBL labs, Olivia Meehan and Steve Martin. We have objects here for various cultures, but particularly Greece and Rome. Here, we're intentionally highlighting more common pieces. So we have a small terracotta lamp, which is my favourite piece, which is something that a slave or a lower class person would have owned. We have a very everyday amphora as well as our fabulous monumental pieces. But this immediately broadens our understanding of diversity in the ancient world. And it's so important for our students to not think erroneously that the ancient world was just the province of elite, male, able-bodied white people. We want them to see that there were people in the ancient world that were just like them. It helps to make it more relevant. We also see this in the way that we teach. This is an example of one of my slides from teaching this year. When we go into, the, into our digital OBL, we like to engage with workplace skills. So for example, archeological drawing, because all of our teachers are practitioners. You can see here what we tell the students, what's in square brackets are the aims of these ideas. So students, for example, in pedestal, as Rita point out, they can manipulate these objects, they can play around with them. So with archaeological drawing, the aim is to create that image down the bottom, and which is one view, half in silhouette and half in detail. The students have to choose one view only, which encourages us to appreciate symmetry or to edit what information is most important. They draw the outline and then they fill in one half. So this is, but what's really important here is this is not only a fundamental skill for archeologists, art historians, this also requires students to collaborate. So because they are in a digital space being thrown into a breakout room, they don't necessarily know who the people they're with. They might have different perspectives. They have different access issues. Immediately students are learning those fundamental workplace skills as well as observation, as well as being able to articulate their concepts, both visually, and through language. Finally, because I'm sure I must be getting close to time, I want to finish by expanding beyond the university gates. Digital OBL creates a space for engaging with broader issues. For example, post-colonialism in the digital space. I'm sure that most people here will be aware of the Nefertiti hack, this idea that objects of important cultural heritage, there are questions about, well, who owns the digital object? Who can access it? This is something that we may have touched on in the subject in the past, but through digital OBL, we're directly relevant to it because students are handling these objects. We're hoping to get them engaged in the creation in them. So when they engage with an issue like this, they're questioning not only how it affects what they're doing now, not only how it affects cultural heritage, which is directly related to ancient world studies, but also broader issues of identity and ethics. These are questions that inform society now and into the future as our students enter the workplace. In summary, through digital object-based learning, our students find a voice in the world and the skills to express it. Thank you. Thanks, Monique. It's awesome to see the work that you're doing in 
um, allowing students to work with these objects in teaching and learning. So brilliant stuff there. Uh, our final speaker today will be Mitch Buzzer. And let me bring up the screen for that one and then we'll launch into our q and I can see some questions coming in so that's fantastic and there's so many things for us to to talk about as well so Mitch is an LMS and edutech professional working predominantly in the humanities and social sciences sector and co-producing interactive videos 360 and VR virtual tours immersive incursions and 3d restorations for languages politics media and comms and ancient world studies his recent focus is on social VR platforms and their potential uh, opportunities for remote work, education, and student-generated content. So um, yeah, Mitch uh, and his team are doing some amazing work in the Faculty of Arts, especially around uh, gaming technology as well. So looking forward to hearing more about that. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you, Ben. I'm just going to remember to optimize for video. So as Ben said, we've got a small and mighty team. Um, there's only four of us and uh, we look after about, or we're in touch with about 250 academics across about 50 different disciplines. But um, a lot of our digital production work is just video for teaching purposes. But we have been kind of branching out into various different things. And that's what I'm gonna show you a bit about today. In terms of uh, this project, this area, um, this is where it all began. So uh, many of you may, have, may already know about this. Um, Ubisoft created two very, very popular games, Assassin's Creed Origins and Odyssey ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. And as you can see from this slide, you know, it was just kind of rich. It was sumptuous. Everything about it was really beautiful. And there was so much there, but <clears throat> even though it was created with historians and archeologists, the question about the accuracy of it and really how does it fit into a university level uh, teaching course was a big one, but also access. I mean, how are we going to get this in front of students? Um, rows of Xboxes in a, uh, in a computer lab somewhere or rows of gaming PCs that, that kind of didn't work. So we came up with a different idea. And when we looked at it, we saw that it really, it was kind of this massive open world um, movie set. And it really did have all the camera moves, including drone shots and another um, novel way that we developed to extract 360 photospheres. So the potential was there for, for um, immersive content later on. It had all the characters and, the dialogue and the action as well. So really had a lot of stuff there. And just to show you a quick video. So the idea would be to screencast a lot of this stuff or screen capture a lot of this stuff and then add voiceovers from the teachers, um, links, PDFs, imagery, and kind of build out modules in LMS and teaching artifacts, you know, teaching assets, sorry, is a better word. But as you can see that the imagery is incredible. And the idea was, I guess, um, to work with the, um, accuracy question and say, you know, um, how accurate is this? That's part of the learning process. It's not about a, a, a strict depiction of what, um, what it was, but it's more about an imagining. And this has been part of um, ancient world studies for a while anyway. So we didn't end up with a, a massive collection of videos as such, but it did kind of spread its tentacles out and become lots of other different things, some prototypes, some experiments, um, but always with the focus on the, the learning journey and what can we give teachers to teach with. Uh, and it's some of these, you know, we're really just about sparking the conversation and, and keeping the kind of ball moving forward. Um, as you can see on the side there, lots of different things. Uh, but we, we um, I'll go through these examples quickly. This is H5P virtual tours. So it was a, a way to add uh, links and voiceovers. Here's a co-production we did with our friends in uh, Biomed. It's a 3D Unity based app uh, teaching hieroglyphics. And the next example is uh, bringing all those beautiful um, photospheres into a social VR platform and allowing people to stand inside them and kind of um, experience them from the inside out. So just to finish up, we, we 
had this idea to keep this close to the teachers and potentially the students as well. So the idea was we wanted to maximize this um, space of lots of free and easy tools. You can see there SketchUp, Tinkercad, um, even Google Earth and Street View we used for another project, which was kind of a spin-off. But the idea of, of camera-less production too was pretty unique, um, particularly over the last couple of years when we were doing a lot of things remotely. Um, and we just didn't want to get stopped because we couldn't record things with people. We wanted to keep going. Um, and so we developed um, uh, on along a couple of lines, but you can see some of them went to very sophisticated level, um, Unity 3D, uh, and some of them stayed quite simple as well. And we didn't want to uh, bring in people like game devs or compositors until it was really necessary. Thanks. Thanks, Mitch. Uh Fabulous uh, overview there of the kinds of work that's being done in in the Faculty of Arts, and we've often we often joked when they bring out a new Assassin's Creed game, we would just find out who taught that subject and then contact them. But it's actually true; that's literally what we would do. So um, I think it's fantastic how the gaming sector is so generous with the use of their material, and these are multi-million dollar often budgets so it's it's to be able to use that content in teaching and learning we just can't afford to spend that much time and money on these things is is brilliant so um there's a question has come in from uh biba who has asked uh i would be interested to discuss data acquisition methods in difficult to capture environments like the ocean to create 3d objects and how about if they are not still objects, but have motion variables such as athletes, so capturing 3D data of athletes, and also underwater? Wow, that's a great question, uh, Bieber. Anyone like from the team like to tackle tackle I'm, that one? I'm furiously typing. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts, Ben? Um, there, uh, underwater photogrammetry is a very challenging because it it's a very challenging environment with visibility issues, um, lighting, lighting um, and stuff. But there, it is quite a, a, a broad field. There are a lot of people doing it. Um, I'll, I'll include a link in my type dancer um, to an organisation like Deep Deep 3D in, in the UK um, have done a lot of stuff. <clears throat> um, there's a Facebook group um, of photogrammetry that has quite a lot of users, but there's probably specific groups as well, just on uh, underwater photogrammetry and 3D scanning. Things that are moving becomes a, a whole new um, ball game because then you, of course, you're looking at doing a whole bunch of uh, data capture from different angles um, on a time sensitive basis. So that becomes much more of a technical challenge in terms of having the equipment to actually capture all of that data um, in a very short space of time. Whereas most of the normal 3D scanning is sort of done in a you know, fairly long time span compared to that. And we've seen examples. I've just put a link in there. The Microsoft have got these mixed reality capture studios where they're doing volumetric capture. So we're seeing that uh, come on board more and more for, for movement. Hugely expensive, hugely data intensive. Uh, we're definitely looking at ways to to do that, I know you can do it on a phone, iPhone. Ben, you've you know been using experimenting all different ways, but yeah, motion does add a uh, a huge amount extra. It's hard enough just doing photogrammetry as well. And John put a comment in there that he's talking about underwater at four p.m. today. So thanks, John. So Ben, that um, that facility you're talking about is a giant dome, isn't it? And I think it's actually very big, isn't it? So the concept, some of them, yeah. So the concept would be to lift it. Turn it upside down and then um, you know submerge it in water. That's a pretty wild idea, but yeah. So <laughs> some really great links and comments in the chat as well about uh, about all this. So I wanted to open up uh, more more generally, and if you've got if you've got questions, uh, put them in there. I want to start with Naomi. Um, so the work that you're doing is is very much yeah open access and can you talk a bit about you know what would be ideal from a from your perspective at the university to help make the process easier for you ben's talked about the siloing of the different areas and the reduction in photographers how have you gone about that for the, the projects you're doing at msd yeah um so i think what i probably didn't 
acknowledge is how many collaborators I had on this project. Like I had expertise from all over the shop, whether it's, and I know that most people in this audience probably, you know, used to 3D photogrammetry, but being a collection manager, I have no, no ability to talk about the technicalities or to scope out the project. So some of the things that Ben's mentioning really, you know, happened to this project. You know, did I know how to articulate what I wanted? No, I didn't. So I had to draw on expertise for it. Was I able to, you know, build, scope it out in a logical sequence so that the person who was actually undertaking the 3D scanning could work with the person who was creating the metadata? So what I've tried to do is, as much as I can, as this project goes along, take snapshots in time and write up notes to myself to share with others about for all the collection managers out there who are possibly going to go and do this thing can I give them the heads up about what's actually involved in terms of copyright I mean I was so lucky with this collection every other digitization project I've had to spend hours and hours and hours sorting out copyright of objects sorting out actually you know when we engage a vendor how do we do it for the I mean the person who made the you know, the 3D scans had to sign over his copyright of the actual 3D scans to say it's going to be open on open access. I, you know, I'm not retaining this copyright. I've done it as a particular way. So I guess that's that's the challenges that I see facing everyone at the university. Yes, you get funding, but have you thought about how it's actually going to work? Yep, and that's a great point. And you mentioned about sharing and documenting information. I mean, we, we, we have the same problem with the long-termness of web pages. Just a blog post will, will disappear after five years because they change providers. So we have that problem with texts, let alone 3D and digital, but any measures we can go to um, to improve that is is useful. Rita, I wanted to ask you about the, the ethics of uh, the 3D capture because you're working with biological specimens and there's often um, aspects associated with that about what you can and can't do. So what, what are the big, uh, what are the big issues for you there? Yeah, I think, look, I used to work, um, I was the curator of the anatomy and pathology museum at Melbourne Uni. So that, that's originally where I met Ben Crennan when he was the photographer. Um, and we, we've always had those issues um, with sensitive collections. So um, no photography, because the, the last thing you want is for somebody to take those images or that, that representation of something and then use it in a way that's not appropriate. So, um, you know, for example, if I can think of something really crude, it would be taking a, um, a virtual model of a skull, printing it out and using it as a, you know, a bowl on a table or something. It's, you know, people do strange things. Um, so, yeah, it's something about, uh, and, and there are a lot of models that I, I wouldn't um, allow to be downloaded for that reason. And it, it's, yeah, but it's a constant struggle about, you know, how do you get an agreement? How do you then manage um, if somebody breaches that agreement? Yeah, it's, it's a really tricky issue. And I think it's only going to become more problematic as we go on. Um, usually people don't have the same sort of issues with teeth. <laughs> I don't know why, but they're sort of considered a bit less sensitive, maybe because they can be removed and you can still be alive. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a big issue. I struggle with it all the time with my collections. Yep. And, and I think that's a, a really good point. And we've talked about it before, but I wonder how other institutions are handling the, the ethics side of it. And does anyone else have a guidelines document on the use of 3D models and, and ethics in their institution? I know we've got guidelines for the use of audio and video material, release forms, that's a well-established process, but I think that it's something that we probably need to do uh, more work on, especially if you're using skulls. Uh, if you're in a 3D environment, and this is a question I had when I was creating some prototypes, should I be allowed to throw a 3D skull of someone or should it be limited to what I can actually do in the virtual world? So there's some questions around that. And I know, Monique, you've got a lot of... Uh, aspects around ethics from your point of view, but but also you mentioned about creating a cohort in the digital space and embracing diversity of students. Can you expand a little bit more on, on some of those areas? 
Certainly. Um, I think firstly, yeah, the idea of equity, of diversity, but also I'd like to speak briefly about the issue of ethics. It's something really interesting for our students. Like as Rita was saying, what are you going to do with someone's skull? We have the death mask and part of the mummy of someone who, was, who died in Egypt more than 3,000 years ago. But that's another question of do we handle this as just an object, just a portrait, or is it actually something that represents someone's Body, someone's final wishes. We have similar issues with things like sarcophagi, so with people's coffins, and also things such as something called a shafti, which is an Egyptian figurine which is placed within your tomb, which is not only the issue, the completely the colonization issue, that it's been taken out of its original context and was put into a museum, has passed into various hands and now come into a teaching collection. Now we are taking these culturally important objects and going even further than the white box idea of a museum, but then putting it just floating in space. And this is something that I think, as Mitch was pointing out with the question of accuracy with the games, this is something that we don't want to brush under the rug. We don't want to just say, well, this is okay. This is something that we actually highlight to our students as an ethic ethical issue as a moral issue and gives them the opportunity to question it so it's something that's really fascinating actually working on this quite a lot at the moment as a post-colonial classicist but I could talk for hours about that I won't um speaking with the idea of the cohort this is something else that's really significant and something I really noticed we as we all know moved to online learning early last year I've always taught online I teach in online intensive every year but one thing that we all would have noticed as educators, for those of us who are educators, across the board was issues of isolation, issues of um, you know, anxiety, well-being issues just went through the roof over the last few years. Particularly because students in, in Melbourne couldn't see each other, couldn't see their friends, couldn't see their family. One thing that I really was really excited to see and something I'm working on in a report at the moment is that putting students into these breakout rooms they were sort of, you know, I don't know these people, I'm not, haven't been speaking to anyone, but then all of a sudden giving them a task to work on that takes them out of themselves. So, you know, for example, here's an amphora. I want you to find the best side that you would draw. What moves is on our archaeological drawings? What best shows the silhouette, but also the imagery? We start seeing students collaborating with each other. This creates a cohort. They start joking together. They start having fun. Also things such as um, digital field work. So walking through Google Earth maps of the Parthenon of the Colosseum. This creates a shared experience for the students that takes them out of themselves for a moment, but then creates long lasting connections. And we even saw this over our winter subject. By the end of the semester, our students had created their own Facebook group. They were having weekly trivia nights. So something that I think is really important to remember is that this, because this digital object-based learning goes beyond those equity issues of only maybe the pushiest student in the class or the best student in the class gets to hold the object. It's a space where everyone can collaborate from all different learning experiences. Yeah, some really great points there, Monique, um, about those things. There's no, no real one answer for all this. Uh, Mitch, I was interested to know from your point of view, what's been the reaction to the students now that you've been introducing these games into the curriculum? probably more so than before. Um, what's some of the feedback been like about those aspects? It's, it's been uh, easier to judge actually in other uh, non-ancient world studies um, areas like journalism um, and areas where we've gone in and used um, immersive media, for example, um, in the journalism program, just showing them, you know, how people are breaking new ground and telling new stories um, but the other one of note is uh, the library of Egyptian steely so that was a project where we developed a method to create um, uh, steely models from like a 10 minute model it was so you take a jpeg or a png from the internet you'd cut it out and kind of make a, a piece of toast kind of model model you just extrude it a bit and then put the jpeg on the front rather than trying to go for a really sophisticated scan, we, we opted for a simple one. A couple of students helped me out with that. So that was good engagement for them. But then that was made as a companion piece to a very, very um, popular um, VR immersive um, uh, teaching component, the, the um, 
Tomb of Nefertari, which a few people might have seen already. Um, just a wildly popular addition to the uh, Egyptian four subject because they were learning hieroglyphics in the normal way, just, you know, PDFs and JPEGs and talking about it and learning from rote. Um, and that's about all I know about it, to, to be honest. But then just seeing them be so absorbed for, you know, up to an hour at a time. Um, so our companion piece is actually about to be deployed uh, to go alongside that Tomb of Nefertari experience. And some of the other stuff, it, it's a bit hard to gauge the um, reaction of people because it ends up in an LMS and it's not something that you can easily get um, a reaction from. But less the students and more the, the teaching staff, everybody is um, um, thirsty for new teaching assets other than just images, just videos, people now feeling this um, com compulsion to find other things to make and do, um, particularly things that um, have the promise or, or that sort of, not the promise, sorry, the, the possibility of a bit of co-creation with students. That's a very popular idea as well. So some of these assets that we're able to extract from the gaming um, realm really map onto that idea really well because you've got, if essentially what you've got is like a digital puzzle kit, if you know what I mean. You can give them images, videos, and then they can go away and add voiceovers and then they can kind of put it all together in a simple way and it becomes teaching asset and activity uh, and a, an engagement tool. So yeah, thanks uh, everyone for your participation. If there's any more questions or if anyone wanted to to ask anything in the as a panelist, then feel free to. Hope that gives everyone a bit of an overview of the kind of work that we're we're doing at the uni. I feel like we're really just starting the process, and it's fantastic that a conference like this exists to be able to to share what we're doing. We're not the only ones coming up against all these issues as well. So um, yeah, and we're we're slowly getting in touch with lots of different faculties as we find out who's who's doing what. So uh, appreciate all the, the comments. So thanks again, everyone. And um, uh, just lastly, looking at, there's a question, are university libraries acquiring digital assets? That's a really great question. Is, are you, uh, is the library create acquiring digital assets? Um, our university library will, no, <laughs> is the short answer. <clears throat> We will take the digital assets of stuff that we already have in physical form and that's owned by the library, but it's owned by faculty, no. <laughs> um, it's just too big a problem, don't you think, Ben Croonan? You can probably talk to a little bit about this. Uh, we'd love to, but I think it's the, um, uh, this, this, this project we did was the first test case of actually putting something on the repository, which means that the university library has a commitment to holding these materials for a long, long time. And I think the hesitancy around that and trying to go through the challenges was, um, it was a doozy, wasn't it, Ben? <laughs> yeah, so I think that the challenge for, for some of the libraries is that they're often sort of receiving physical items that normally aren't their sort of um, their normal domain. So it's, it's almost like, okay, the library kind of is a glam organisation within itself in that there are various aspects of the library that are galleries and archives and museums, but it's not it's not really um, set up for actually dealing with all of those particular issues very well. Um, so there are some, some challenges within that sort of space, even just with the physical items as well. I was going to say, I think that libraries do well at the accessibility part of it. Um, you know, you, you can you can store yes. many things um, if you have a lot of space, but being able to access the, the right thing and find what you're after, I think is, is the main focus yeah. there. So I was very... Um, interested to hear about this library approach. You know, I think that's, uh, that's really important for the future. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, I guess, for, for, for some comments. And I, I just wanted to um, you know, summarize, I'm really interested in the whole ethical um, side of things. And um, it seemed that, you know, the creation of a 3D model out of an object, that there are a number of stakeholders associated with that, you know, the original creator of that object, um, the country that owns that object was something that Monique raised um, about the Nefertiti bust. There's that to consider. So the you know the creator, the provenance, 
the person doing the work, it's a lot of work. Okay, so there, obviously there's to be, there was a point made in a chat uh, by Michael that, you know, the photographer has obviously has some sort of rights over the photo, right? So there's these at least three stakeholders, if not more. And how do we negotiate all those different, all those different ownerships? Um, it's a complex issue and hope, hopefully something that we can get some sort of framework around because I think it's only going to get more complicated and cause more problems. I think one thing is we can look at, you know, film and TV and music. They've got a very specific way to credit. You know, you've got your credit mm. role at the end of a film. Music, there's multiple la layers of copyright in a song. You've got the people who wrote the song, the people that, you know, own, own the publishing of the song. So I think we need, for digital objects like this, you've got to have that uh, type of deep complexity in the, in the ownership. Otherwise, it's very surface-like. There's a big problem with journal articles. You know, it's like everyone gets an equal um, billing. I mean, yes, there's an order, but who did what on there? There's, it's not very refined in terms of, you know, academic publishing um, compared mm. to other disciplines. So I think we just look at other disciplines as well. Mm. Mm. NFTs are, you know, uh, are developing to, to represent digital ownership as well. So maybe libraries need to be given a cryptocurrency wallet and uh, purchase some NSTs, NFTs. Call it the buzzer. I'll have two buzzer coins, please. There you go, Mitch. There's a niche for you. I was going to say, just something I'm really allergic to in our discipline is, I mean, we have like lots of design studios where the students go and work with academics go and scan sites. Um, and then that becomes the research material later on. And in future, people want to go back and access these scans. But actually, because no one actually documents who's taken the scans and that future long-term use of those scans is absolutely problematic. So it's one of the things we're thinking through and we're trying to nut up some guidelines, but it's very, very hard to do. I've, I've had experiences in going to flying overseas to archives to digitize that material. So there's a flight, there's, you know, a week or two of effort involved and you come back with this massive um, collection of, of, of digital media. Um, and there's some people around that feel that mm, they should just be able to get that for free. And you think, well, okay, so I've got a grant to pay for this. Yeah. I spend my own time doing this. So there's, I think there would be a natural human reaction against just making these things freely available. I think there's that side to consider. Um, you know, we also have to consider that things should be freely available for, for whatever reason. But, you know, I don't think it's as easy as saying that, you know, everything should be shareable. Um, there was, I think it's about, sorry, sorry about I was going to say, I think to come in on those, as um, Ben mentioned, I'm really active in academic community engagement. I work a lot with people beyond the university, secondary schools and things like that. And what's really wonderful about, say, um, our collection, the Quarry collection, and various other ones, is that they are freely available online. So I gave a class to a year 10, it's a year 10 Zoom class every day using our objects. So that's what's wonderful about it is that rather than really containing our knowledge that it's only allowed if you can make your way through the university gates or university digital gates that we can actually share this and people can be aware of it but like you said Frederick then you have the opposite issue of do people know that someone else shares it, that someone else owns this and who does own this now mm. so there are so many differences like you said particularly if they come from a different culture as well mm, exactly yeah great points that was an awesome panel thank you very much guys and uh thanks for thank you Ben you You've done an expert job at managing it and keeping on time. You even finished slightly early and left the room for, for some of my questions as well, which is great.